So I have the pleasure of introducing Mary Ann. Mary Ann Anderson has a heart problem, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and high hopes to live out the rest of her years in good health. But this is not why she's speaking to you today. Her years as an educator, poet, and performer have taught her to see how to see the world with an open mind and a heart filled with compassion. She joined UU because she was searching for her tribe, her fellow world citizens, and found that the seven principles summed up her beliefs and practices perfectly. As for beatification, she asks only to be honored as a person with a giving heart and a lovely voice. Today's sermon is titled Meditations on the Heart to be Delivered by Mary Ann Anderson. Mary Ann? Please unmute yourself. Aloha all from Maui. I would like to begin with a third reading that I just could not resist sharing with you. It's a poem by Stephen Crane from the Black Writers and Other Lines. It's called In the Desert. In the desert, I saw a creature naked bestial who squatting upon the ground held his heart in his hands and ate of it. I said, is it good friend? It is bitter. Bitter, he answered, but I like it because it is bitter and because it is my heart. The heart pumps blood throughout the body, carrying oxygen and nutrients to every cell. It's this circulation of blood that is vital to sustaining life. The heart is an organ made up of several tough layers of muscle. The pericardium is the thin layer that covers the exterior, while the endocardium lines the inside walls. The heart is divided into four chambers, two upper and two lower. The upper chambers, known as the atrium, receive blood coming into the heart. The lower chambers are the ventricles that pump blood out. Between each chamber are valves that open and close and help keep the blood moving. They are the tricuspid, mitral, pulmonary, and aortic valves. A pumping cycle starts when oxygen-depleted blood returns to the heart after circulating throughout the body. The blood enters through the right atrium before flowing to the right ventricle. It's then pumped to the lungs via the pulmonary arteries. There, blood is rejuvenated by air that's breathed in. The oxygen-rich blood returns to the heart through the left atrium, where it goes to the left ventricle. Then, by way of the aorta artery, the fresh blood is pumped throughout the body before the process repeats itself. That process happens with every heartbeat, and it's relentless. The heart beats 100,000 times a day, 40 million times a year, and up to 3 billion times over an average lifespan. But there are conditions that can disrupt a heartbeat and that normality. They can range from myocardial infarction, or a heart attack, to heart disease and hypertension. In contrast, exercise and emotional excitement can also have an impact on a person's heartbeat. The various blood vessels that comprise the circulatory system are a network of veins, arteries, and capillaries that span over 60,000 miles throughout the body. And the heart is the pump at the center of it. So here we've just seen a fairly simple explanation of the heart, the organ of the body. Many of you know this already, but I'd I thought I'd show it for the interesting statistics of the how often it beats and how many miles of blood flows through us. Uh, but no, this is not a lecture on the anatomy of the aorta, the valves and their bodily function. Let us dig a little deeper and get to the heart of the matter. Let's explore that force which drives us and guides us and keeps us alive. How do we react physically, mentally, and spiritually to the events of our lives? After all, 
We are not robots. We are emotional, sensory-driven beings who are constantly in search of the right stuff. Well, if you ask me, it starts with the heart. That's where it all begins. So in this talk today, I'm going to be introducing music that brings us closer inside. Um, the first uh, one, let's get into a comfortable position and, and take a deep breath and set the outside world and thoughts free for a minute close our eyes and see our, for ourselves what we are hearing. Where do we begin? Begin with the heart. Yes, where do we begin? You're going to see a slide now of, of the heart um, in just a minute. Yes, yeah, so when I look at this, you know, don't those arteries look like upside down trees? <laughs> they're, they're the veins that carry our life flow, the ever expanding, retracting sac that keeps the blood flowing from the beginning of life to the end of our time on earth. The heart, the organ, the pump, the essence. I can almost feel it pulsating. And as you can tell, I don't look at things very scientifically. I mean, I'm mostly a right brain gal with a, a few left brain attributes. After all, my husband calls me the German and the hippie. But when I observe this image, I can't help but seeing and feeling life. The heart is charged with a great task. It's the breath of blood flow, the life-giving force. It's so perfectly in tune with itself and moves to its own beat, sometimes faster, especially when we're excited or afraid, or slower when we're relaxed or meditating. Yeah, you know, I remember one time I was taking vocal lessons and I was doing a, a Bach vocal piece and I had problems finding just the right tempo. So my teacher put his hand on my wrist and counted off. It's in the pulse, he said. Oh, but what if I'm nervous or excited before I perform, I asked. Well, then do it faster, he chuckled. I, I never thought of Bach that way before, but it did make perfect sense. I mean, his music feels so organic. One source says that the heart can expand its energy in other ways, through pulsation, vibration, 
waves of emotion that circulate through the whole body and out into the world. Joseph Campbell said, the goal of life is to make your heartbeat match the beat of the universe, to match your nature with nature. What does this mean? How can we give so much power to a simple organ, a mere function of the body? Can the heartbeat really match the rhythm of the universe? <laughs> well, that's a big challenge. And what exactly is the beat of the universe? Now, that sounds a little esoteric, doesn't it? I know I'm getting a little hippie to be here, but just sit back for another quick moment and close your eyes and listen to the heartbeat alone. It's the touchstone of our survival. No wonder we ponder its importance, its power over the head even, or reason, or <laughs> sensibility. A new study by Daily Motion Amaze Lab indicates that while listening to the same story, humans' heartbeats sync up. It could pose pretty interesting evolutionary advantages. Researchers had participants listen to the same bits of both and a book and an instru instructional video. And using an electrocardiogram, they found the participants' heartbeats fluctuated in unison, depending on the part of the track they were listening to. What's more, they didn't even need to be listening together. This phenomenon occurred even when they were miles away in a different location. The researchers say it's less about how emotionally engaged the participants are and more about the attention they were paying to what's going on. Adding that to that, when the listeners were distracted, their heartbeats would not sink. And here's why the, the researchers believe this occurs and why it might be evolutionarily advantageous. We think it is because you need to be ready to act at a moment's notice. And for that, you need to know what is going on around you. In other words, you need to be conscious of what is happening around you, even if it's just a story. Hmm, close connection there to the seventh principle, isn't it? Well, think, think of all the ways that we refer to the heart. A lot of them cliches, but heartache, it's not something that an aspirin will cure. Heart of stone means cold and unfeeling. Your cheating heart equals deception. And how many rash decisions have we made blaming my foolish heart? And how can we mend a broken heart, the Bee Gees asked. Well, we can't exactly stitch it together, can we? A broken heart. Now, that's an interesting one. Have you ever heard of anyone who died of a broken heart? Unfortunately, I have. I had a friend who lost his wife tragically, and within six months, he was gone. He couldn't live without her. He died of heart failure. Looks like the heart is very closely related to emotional response and feelings. So what guides us? Are we guided by the heart or, or the head or both? There are numerous studies done that reveal the interconnectedness of the heart and the head. Professor Sarah Garfinkel of the University of Sussex writes, Cardiovascular arousal, the bit of the heart's cycle when it is working hardest, can intensify feelings of fear and anxiety. In this study, people were asked to identify scary or neutral images while their hearts beats were tracked. Of course, they reacted quicker to the scary images when their heart was contracting and pumping blood compared with when it was relaxing. This suggests that electrical signals from blood vessels around the heart feed back into the brain areas involved in emotional processing, influencing how strongly we think we're feeling something. So 
So when the heart is beating faster, we feel more intense fear or anxiety, right? And when it's slower, we get the reverse. A calm mind can actually help us deal much better with stress and emergency situations. You've heard of people calm in, in, the, in the heat of panic. They, they calm down. But can the reverse also be true? What if we act on feelings before reason? After all, we fall in love, don't we? Reason flies out the window and we act on emotional response. Or are we level-headed, assessing the pros and cons of perhaps having a relationship with another person? What do we base our decisions on? Well, my guess is that it's kind of a split decision. And sooner or later, one might just win out. Or maybe they both agree. And <laughs> those are the lucky ones. Now here's an interesting piece of history. When Thomas Jefferson fell in love with the married Maria Cosway, a battle ensued, not between him and her husband, who was very estranged from her, but between his heart and his head. In a letter, long letter to her, I'll just read a few excerpts, he wrote of the dialogue between these two superpowers. Heart. I am indeed the most wretched of all earthly beings, overwhelmed with grief, every fiber of my frame distended beyond its natural powers to bear. I would willingly meet whatever catastrophe should leave me no more to feel or to fear. Head. These are the external, eternal consequences of your warmth and precipitation. This is one of the scrapes into which you are ever leading us. You confess your follies indeed, but still you hug and cherish them, and no reformation can be hoped where there is no repentance. Hard. Oh, my friend, this is no moment to upbraid my foibles. I am rent into fragments by the force of my grief. If you have any balm, pour it into my wounds. If none, do not harrow them by new torments. Spare me this awful moment. Yes, I exaggerate. But yes, indeed. I'm sure a lot of it has, us have fought a similar battle. Our emotions, the heart, set us up for excitement or catastrophe, and sometimes happiness. But the head, with its rational sensibility, often dictates the final outcome, and indeed, Jefferson's head won out, much to his lifelong sorrow. So what's love got to do with all this? The biggest association we can make with the heart is the word love. Love is the heartbeat of all life, said Paramahansa Yogananda. Now get ready because we're going to sit back again and hear a beautiful thought turned into a prayer or a chant. It's a, the, um, the poet Hafiz, uh, 14th century, uh, wrote a uh, mystic. He wrote a, a, something that goes just like this. The heart is a thousand stringed instrument that can only be tuned with love. So I'd like you to sit back again and enjoy this wonderful, wonderful chant or song or prayer, whatever you'd like to call it. But feel that pulse. Welcome the peaceful energy as it transcends into your heart. And pay attention to the rhythm, the drumbeat or the heartbeat, if you will.
types of love can benefit your heart, says Dr. Christopher Suhar, the current division head of Scripps Center for Integrative Medicine. It's not just romantic love that can improve your heart. Having close, loving relationships with your friends and family can have cardiovascular benefits. Many surgeons counsel their patients about the importance of support after surgery, he continues. This support includes not only spouses, but close friends and family. Researchers have investigated the role of having the support of loved ones after cardiac bypass surgery, or even other surgeries. Over time, patients who had good social support had better recovery and survival rate. Surrounding yourself with people who love you, no matter the relationship, can also make you feel more inclined to follow medical advice and to take an active part in your care, which can improve recovery. And in my opinion, this includes all kinds of recovery, whether from surgery or from pain or addiction. A good example of this can be found in our own backyard. Many of you know Mary Ann Grau. She's a fellow Cambrian who was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in 2016. And to tell you the truth, she's still alive and kicking up her heels today. Her book, Cancer and Fishnet Stockings, is a must read and a prime example of support and the gratitude she, expressed, she expresses. Here's an excerpt. I wish I had Marianne. I wish I had asked you to read this for us. I know you're here. So I crawled into bed and hoped stillness would ease the pain. I had curled up into the fetal position, clutching my stomach, crying hysterically, and cursing myself for letting the pain get ahead of me. Frightened beyond imagination, I begged Norb not to leave me. He immediately got under the covers, wrapped himself around my trembling body, and began to rock me gently. And in what must be a contender for one of the most romantic scientific insights to date, couples have been shown to have a tendency to synchronize heartbeat and breathing. So now I'd like to sing a song for you. It was going to be the anthem, but we decided to put it inside here. Oh, look at that. That's the locks of love in Paris. And as Treva pointed out, it's dated because you can see the spire of Notre Dame. Anyway, this is a song by Atlas, and I love it. It's called Keep Me in Your Heart. Even when I'm far away When the morning comes and those tears won't stop Please keep me in your heart Keep me on your side Well, you know, sometimes I run and even when the tears, oh, they fall from your eyes, please keep me on your side. You know I'd wait for you a thousand years. How would you do the same for me? And I would swim across the loneliest sea if it meant you could be free, my love. Oh, you mean that much to me. Keep me on your mind, even when I am far away. And even though I know you may tire of me someday, please keep me in your heart. Keep me in your heart, don't let me get away. When the morning comes and those tears won't stop, please keep me in your heart, my love. However far apart we may become, 
please keep me in your heart. Thank you. Ask any person who owns a dog or a cat or a horse or a bird for that matter. Doesn't it feel good to spend time with your four-legged or your winged friend? Pet ownership also helps people survive together longer after a heart procedure, notes Dr. Suhar. Now this relationship has been looked at in both dogs and cats. And those two animals provide a definite benefit from a survival perspective. I believe it is because of the unconditional love that pets give you and that you give them in return. Because when you emit love and your love emotion from the heart, it's, it's, it gets strengthened more and more. I learned that, that pet adoptions uh, increased during the pandemic. Well, why wouldn't they? You know, we need touch, human or otherwise. It does a heart good, as they say. But tomorrow is Valentine's Day. One I must admit I shied away from when I was single for so many years until I decided to send myself a Valentine's Day card. I figured if I couldn't love myself, I was in deep trouble. Perhaps you know part of the story already of St. Valentine, but let, let me refresh your memory. It's a very interesting story. In, in, in the third century AD, it is said that Valentine, who was a priest, defied the order of Emperor Claudius and secretly performed Christian weddings for couples, allowing the husbands hmm, to escape constriction into the pagan army. This legend claims that soldiers were sparse at this time, so this was a big inconvenience to the emperor. The account mentions that in order to remind these men of their vows and God's love, St. Valentine is said to have cut hearts from parchment, giving them to these persecuted Christians. A possible origin of the widespread use of hearts on St. Valentine's Day which unfortunately earned him a death sentence. And yes, Hallmark loves this day as well as florists and chocolatiers. But personally, I think we should celebrate and practice love every day, not only with our partners, but with other humans and animals and plants and oceans and our mother earth. So what can we conclude here? that this sac of hemoglobin is the grand central station of the entire body. All blood passes through it, ticking like a good Swiss clock. It keeps on pumping until one day it stops. And that's the end of our physical life. Yeah, so here we are. Hafiz also wrote, carry your heart through this world like a life-giving sun. I love this image. I love looking at that image of the hand. Maybe we can go back to that image there, Randy. Yes, I love looking at that. Carry your heart through this world like a life-giving sun. I must give due musical credit today to Leah Hokanson and the Songkeeper Women's Choir in British Columbia for the CD Diamond Chance, Volume 1. This is my immediate go-to whenever I want to relax, calm down and reach a state of peace. And if you're interested in procuring this, just get a hold of me and I'll tell you how. So I'm going to leave you with one more of their songs with those lyrics, carry your heart through this world like a life-giving song. I can't say that enough. And I thank you all very much and wish you a happy Valentine's Day.